Hey, it's good to be with you. We've had an amazing few services, so I'm excited to bring the word this morning. And uh, Pastors Dave and Donna, they're actually at our TFH Natomas launch this morning. I think it's happening right now, so that is just amazing. That's our fourth plant. We got four campuses, four prison campuses. God is just doing so much um, through this community, and it's just amazing to think about what he has done so far and what he's going to continue to do, so that is exciting. But today, I will be concluding our series that we've been in called Altars. How many of you guys have enjoyed this series? It has been so good. And if you have not, like if you missed some of the services or sermons, please go back, watch them, listen to them, because they are, I think it's just important of what God's doing right now in our church and in our lives uh, individually. So go back, listen to those. Uh, But last week, Pastor Dave, he talked about how the altar is a place of cleansing and commissioning. And he said this, when we come to the altar, we are touching eternity and our interaction with the internal prepares and qualifies qualifies us to live the lives that God has intended for us. And today, I want to continue in this conversation about uh, building lives in our altars, because guess what? At the altar, the perfect plan for God for your life is at the altar of worship. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But before we do, because here's the thing, every single one of you, right, even if you don't even have a relationship with Jesus yet, or you've been walking with him forever, every single one of us wants to know what God's design and the perfect plan is for our lives. So before we dive in today, I I wanna just sing this song, and uh, it's called Refiner, and really it's a prayer, it's a declaration, it's a cry, and it's been the cry of my heart. And I've been praying all week that if it isn't the cry of your heart, that it would become the cry of your heart this weekend. So whether you're at East Bay, Roseville, Napa campus, prison campuses, wherever you guys are watching today and in this room, I just want you to have just a personal moment with him even before we jump into the message because I know by the power of the Holy Spirit that he is going to speak to you today. And, um, and we're gonna get real with God. We're just gonna bring our hearts before him. But before we even do that, let's just make this personal. Don't think to the person to the right or to the left, but just ask the Holy Spirit, what do you wanna speak to me today? You know, I go to every service usually on the weekends, all three services, and it's usually the same worship set. It's usually the same message most of the time. And I can come in and just, oh, it's another service. But no, I come in every time expecting God to speak something different, to do something different. Why? Because the hunger in the room is different. The people in the room are different. God is always doing something new. And so I want you to have that same expectation today that God would want to speak to you, that he knows your name, he knows where you're at. And so let's just take this moment right now. Father, we welcome you here. God, we know you're already here and we've worshiped you, but we just take this moment, just this this time that we have, Lord, and we just set our eyes on you today. And if the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a Sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I wanna be consumed. I wanna be tried by fire and purified. You take whatever you desire, and Lord, He is my life. And if your glory wants to come in, let it fall, we want it all. Lord, your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be your
purify my heart Cause I wanna burn for you And only for you And take my life as a sacrifice Cause I wanna burn for you, yeah, yeah Only, come on, make it personal today Oh, so clean my hands, purify my heart Thank you guys for worshiping with just that moment, that declaration, that song. And I want to tell you today, it's not just a song, it's not just words, not just like, oh, this is a sweet moment. Because obviously the song is not really a sweet song. We're asking the Lord to refine us with fire. So it's like, whoa, this is aggressive. We're going straight in today. But here's the thing, when we sing songs like that, when we say declarations like that, Lord, here is my life, he meets us right there. He meets us right there in the midst of it. And I want to look in uh, Romans 12. Paul tells us this. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, his perfect will. Paul's urging us here in Romans 12. He is saying, in view, in light of all that God has done for you, offer your bodies as a sacrifice. If you're new to church, you're like, eh, knew these people were crazy. You're putting bodies on the altar. What's happening? What he's saying there is he's saying your full being, your body represents your mind, your soul, your emotions, everything that you are. He's saying, give all that you are to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform or think like the world does, right? The world tells us, oh, find your truth, live your truth, live by feelings, do whatever you want. But that's actually in rebellion to what God's ways say. And it says, be transformed and renewed in your mind. How do we do that? By the power of his word. It changes the way that we think. Then, everybody say then. Then your life will prove what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Bingo. There it is, folks. You're welcome. See you next week. Okay. This is like, this is the answer that every human being is looking for. Thank you, Paul, for just making it simple, right? Everybody wants to know what the purpose for their life is. And it's right there in Romans 12. So why is it that every, there's so many people, so many believers walking around, I don't know what God wants for my life. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. Oh, ah, like stressed out. When Paul's like, here you guys go. It's like an ABCD list. Just follow that and you're going to find the purpose and will and the acceptable thing for your life. And why is that? Why do we not live this out? I'll tell you why. Sacrifice, right? Sacrifice is not easy. Sacrifice doesn't always feel good. Sacrifice usually costs us something. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't start out by saying, you sacrifice your life and then God will bless you. No, no, no. He starts out by telling us, he urges us. He said, in view of God's mercies, 
in light of all that he has done for you, the least that you could do is give God your life, is give God your all. In Titus 3, 5, it says, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Now, some of you might be thinking like, well, what are the mercies of God? Like mercy, mercy, like I'm not sure what she's saying here. Here's the thing. The fact that all the sins that you have committed in your past and will commit in your future, God has already forgiven them. That is the mercy of God, right? The, the Bible says when you wake up in the morning, his mercies are new every day. His compassion, his love towards you. The fact that you're sitting in this room and all our other locations and you are breathing in air right now into your lungs, your heart is beating. You have the free will to lift your hands in worship and accept the salvation of Jesus in your life. These are the mercies of God, people. It doesn't get any better than this. God's mercy, we do not deserve it. I think of the personal mercies in my own life. The, the fact that every day I wake up, I do not deserve his kindness. I do not deserve his acceptance and his forgiveness. Yet every single day he offers it to me freely. That is the mercy of God. I do not deserve that. He has protected me. He's guarded me. He pulled me out of insecurity and self-hatred and set his confidence inside my life. That is the mercy of God. He's healed my body time and time again. He's actually saved me from literal death multiple times. These are the mercies for God. We do not deserve them, but yet he so freely gives them to us. And that's what Paul is saying in view, in light of everything that God has done for you the least that you can do, the proper act of worship is laying your lives before him. But here's the thing, where most people get stuck in their journey is they come to a moment of sacrifice, a decision that requires obedience and looks like maybe a potential loss, and we either climb the mountain of sacrifice and obedience and discover God's good and acceptable and perfect will, or we turn back, we take an alternate route, and we live in the lowlands of the what ifs and why God right? And I want to read a story today in, in Genesis 22. It talks about a man who went up a mountain. He surrendered himself to Jesus. He laid a sacrifice before him. His name's Abraham. Kind of a big deal. He's like the father of the faith and stuff and the friend of Jesus. And we've talked about him a little bit, but I want to read this story. It's kind of a classic story. There's been movies made on it and all kinds of things. But I want to refresh you today at all our loca locations. I want to refresh you in this. And we're going to read together um, from Genesis 22, verse 1. It starts right here. Now, after these things, God tested the faith and commitment of Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. And God said, take now your son, your only son of promise, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham, he got up early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son, Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. And then he got up and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day of travel, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here with the donkey. The young man and I will go over there and worship God, and we will come back to you. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac, his son. And he took the fire pot in his own hand, and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. And Isaac said to Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. Isaac said, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two walked on together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood and bound Isaac, his son, and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham reached out his knife and took the knife to kill his son. But then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, thank God. No, he said, here I am. <laughs> He's like, just in time, waiting till the last minute, huh? Okay. He said, the Lord said, do not reach out with the knife in your hand against the boy and do nothing to harm him. For now, I know that you fear God with reverence and profound respects since you have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise. Then Abraham looked up and he glanced around and be behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. Everybody say thicket. It's such a good word by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering, a sinning sacrifice instead of his son. So Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day on the mountain of the Lord, it will be seen and it will be provided. 
Whoa, what a story, huh? And if that's the first time you heard it, you're like, whoa, once again, this is getting crazy. People are offering their children on, on sacrifices. Like, what is happening? This story is crazy. And the more you dig into it, the more I've been digging into it and just you know, getting the revelation of what was actually taking place here, I personally had to ask myself, God, do I trust you? Do I trust you? Like, Abraham trusted you, like without hesitation. And I want to look at a couple of things today that Abraham's life displays for us. I want us to pull these out because I believe that they apply to us even today in 2020, uh, Abraham's life. So in order for you to live your best life and find the good and perfect will of God, it's going to require, number one is this, complete trust in the faithfulness of God. So now I want you to ask the question to yourself because I already asked it. Do you trust God? Ask yourself, like, do I really trust God? You're like, of course. Someone in the first service was like, Yes. But I'm not talking like bumper sticker trust. You know what I mean? Like, of course I trust the Lord. Like, no, I'm talking like big trust. Like when he says, give me everything, are you like, of course, let's go? Or is there hesitation? Because that is what Abraham had. He had trust without hesitation because he believed and knew the faithfulness of God. But why, how did Abraham have this kind of faith and trust in God? Well, he had history with God, right? He had, this wasn't just the first day he got saved and then the next day God's like, kill your son. That would be really intense. No, this was over decades of time of Abe seeing the faithfulness of God throughout his life. God had promised him a son, right? He had promised Isaac to him, but he didn't see the fulfillment of that promise for 25 years. But God was still faithful on his promise and on his word. There were times of famine where God would provide. There were uh, enemies that that God defeated for Abraham over and over and over again. He saw the faithfulness of God in his life. God always came through on his promise. And he could trust God because he knew his character. And I just want to tell you today, if you're new to faith and you're like, well, I don't have decades of time that I've been spending with the Lord, so I don't really know if I can trust him like this, I want to let you know today, you can trust God by his word. So open up his word, which is his Bible. In the Bible, there are promises and there are scriptures of who God says he is. There's stories like this that build our faith to know God is faithful and he is true and he is good and he can be trusted. So if you don't know and you're like, oh man, I don't have the decades of time to look back on, you can go to his word and build up your faith. Here's the deal. All of us are in a personal journey right now in discovering if we can trust God, right? We're taking steps in our faith journey, wherever you are on that journey. And as you take those steps, no matter what it looks like, I wanna encourage you today, don't stop trusting. Even if it's like, I, wow, like what I see right now, I don't know if I can trust him. Take the steps and don't stop trusting him. In Hebrews 11, it kind of gives like an overview of what we had read in Genesis 22. It says this, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. What? Okay, here's the, this is crazy. Abraham, up to this point, there was no history of anybody being raised from the dead. There was, there was no precedent for this kind of miracle. Jesus wasn't on the scene yet. Nobody had been raised from the dead. But here Abraham said, God, even if you take my son's life, I know that the promise is, is that he, Isaac is the fulfillment to the promise. So I'm trusting you on your promise that he can't, he can't die because he is what you said would happen. So he's trusting God with a situation that is literally impossible, that he has no, like he can't go back in his memory bank or think back to scripture and be like, oh, God raised this person from the dead. No, he has no clue. But yet he's like, God, I believe that if he dies, you will raise him back from the dead because you will stay true to your promise. This is great faith. This is insane faith. We have to know God, knowing his word and his promises, it keeps us with the mercies in view, right? It keeps us reminding ourselves that we can trust him. And in order for you to live your best life and find the good and perfect will of God, it's going to require a second thing, and that is unconditional obedience. Check out verse five. It says, Abraham tells his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. It's a statement of faith. But he says, the boy and I will go and worship. This is the first mention of worship in the canon of scripture. The first time we see worship. And the word that is used here in Hebrew is shaka. Shaka. It's like, just try that. Shaka. I was trying to practice it so I could be like, guys, look at this. Shaka. And no, I can't do it. 
But basically what this word means, it simply means to bow down and submit to God's will. News brief, worship is not music, right? It's a part of it. But worship, and in, in when we sing songs and everyone's jumping, like, you can do that without worshiping. Worship is not just music. It's not just our mouths opening. It is living a life of trust and obedience. When we worship God with our lives, we're saying, God, I trust you no matter what. I give you my all because you are good and you are faithful. And I want you to picture this today. I'm going to go to the keys because that's where I feel comfortable. So I'm just going to walk over there for a second. Everyone stay with me. I want you just to imagine this picture, this image that we just read about, okay? Abraham is walking up this mountain, right? And he says, me and the boy are going to go worship. And Abraham had like an entourage. He was like kind of a big deal. So you know his servants are probably like, wait, just you and the boy? Okay. And Abraham was a man of faith, as we've seen. He trusted God at his word. He'd seen him do all kinds of miracles and be, f- fulfill his promise. So he's walking up this mountain. And, you know, in our minds, we probably think, oh, Abraham's like just strong, like strutting up. Well, here we go. We're going to go and obey the Lord. But no, Abraham, even though he trusted God, I'm sure there was some fear and hesitation in his heart, right? He's got his son, his promised son, the son that God gave him. And he's taking him up the mountain and he's saying, we will go worship. And his life displaying to us, I believe that, yes, this is the Old Testament, but what Abraham did that day, the father of our faith, he was showing us today in 2020 what it is to worship. He was giving us a a firsthand example that it's not just about songs, it's not just about, you know, singing Caleb in your car. No, it's about going up the mountain and sacrificing some stuff. And, you know, so you just picture this, like his hands are probably shaking. He has a knife in one hand, he has a fire pot in the other. Isaac's asking all these questions like, wait, God, where's, or Abraham, or dad, what's his name? Dad, where's the, where's the sacrificial lamb? You know, and at this point, Abraham's in his hundreds, so you know, Isaac's probably like, dad's losing it. Like he's literally lost his mind. He's going to sacrifice his son. And what? Yeah, we need to go back down. And I'm sure in Abe's mind, he's like, let's just run the other direction. Let's go back to safety. Let's just go back to our normal lives and just live, you know, how we were living before. But no, he trusted God. I mean, I'm sure even in his mind, there was a point where he's like, God, why not Sarah? She's already hundred years old. You know I mean? Like she's going to be with you soon anyways. Let's just do that. Isaac can stick around for a few more generations, (laughs) right? These are the things I think about just during the week when I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, Lord, why not Sarah? That would have been great. But here he is, all this stuff. He's a human being. He's not an angel. He's not a God. He is a human being, just like you and me, walking up this hill, trusting God and worshiping with this display. And I just want you to get that picture in your mind today because I believe that God is going to ask many of us to do the same thing. Obviously not sacrifice our children on a physical altar, but he's going to ask for some tough stuff to lay down before him and to remember this moment in time that this is worship. And I just even see like his life as he's walking up. He's just inside. He's just basically saying, here I am to worship. Not with song, but what he was doing, right? Here I am to bow down, and here I am to say that you're my God. As he's walking up, you're all together lovely, you're all together worthy, you're all together wonderful to me. Oh, so here I am to worship, and here I to bow down and here I am to say that you're my God cause you're all together lovely you're all together worthy Jesus all together wonderful to me oh you never fail me Lord I can trust in you Time and time again You have been good, oh God So I will not fear I will not fear Cause you are with me Even on the mountain of sacrifice When I don't understand what's in front of me I can trust you Cause 
displaying worship in that moment for us today. This is how I come to the altar of the Lord as I just sit at my piano and I just sing songs like that. <laughs> just God, I might not understand it all, but I know that you're faithful, you are good, you are true. And you know, today, as God is gonna ask many of us to sacrifice some things on that altar, here's the deal, some of you have delayed the promises of God You've prolonged the process of knowing his will for your life because of partial obedience. You won't build the altar where and when God has asked you to. And this is real. Even last night, everyone was like, whoa, during the service. I was like, oh, but it's real. It's heavy, right? God has asked us all to lay something down. And we can prolong the promises that are on the other side of the altar because of partial obedience because of withholding trust from God and saying, oh, I don't know, like I'm not sure that you're going to do what you said you were gonna do or when I thought that you were gonna do what you said and then it didn't happen, I'm confused, I don't understand, so therefore I'm just gonna stand back a little bit. But there's something that God is asking of you and guess what, it's a new day. There's another chance. If you've waited decades, if you've waited years and you've neglected the altar, his mercies are new every single day. And you, it's not too late for you. In verse nine, it says, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there without any hesitation, without any complaining, without negotiating if it was Sarah or Isaac, he obeyed and he built the altar right where God had asked him to. Unconditional obedience. And I wanna tell you this, once we've built the altar that God has asked of our lives, once we have set that up, we are positioning ourselves for the miracle moment in our lives and in our future. And as the band comes up, I wanna read the back half of what happened on that mountain for Abraham and Isaac. It says this in verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from, from heaven a second time. And that's another message in itself. When you position yourself at the altar, that's where God continually speaks. So a second time, God says, by myself on the basis of who I am, I have sworn an oath, declares the Lord, that since you have done this thing and have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sand of the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies as conquerors. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have heard and obeyed my voice. The promise came to pass. The abundance came to pass because you have have not withheld from me, God said. Because you have not withheld, I will bless you. Abraham received the full promise because he did not withhold from God. He trusted God's faithfulness. He had unconditional obedience. He worshiped God at the altar of sacrifice. And on the other side of that altar is his will and his purpose. And the same thing is for us today. I wanna ask you this, what are you withholding from God? I think every single one of us, no matter who you are, myself included, we are all holding something from God. We are all withholding something deep inside, whether it was something that is not good, a relationship or an addiction, or whether it's something that is great. And it's the promise like Isaac. And you're like, God, you blessed me with this. Why do you wanna take it away? But the thing is, God doesn't want you to lay it down so that he can just ruin your life and cause pain and destruction. No, on the other side of the altar of sacrifice and worship is the fulfillment to everything that God has destined and designed for you specifically. And my cry for you today is don't stay in partial obedience. You can call yourself a Christian, you can come to church, you can have the bumper sticker, you can do all this stuff, you can raise your hand and worship, but if your heart is not saying, God, you can have all of me, then it's only partial obedience. It's not full trust and therefore you are withholding from the King of Kings, the Father who knows all things, who is faithful to his word, who is faithful to his promise time and time again. His mercies are new to you every single day. And I, my heart and my prayer, and I believe the heart of the Holy Spirit today is that you would not stay in this place. You would not stay in the lowlands and choose the easy route, which really in the end is never easy. When God is saying on the other side, 
I have everything you need, everything that you want, everything that I have designed for you. You know, a few, few months ago, or actually probably weeks ago, I was just withholding some trust from God. I was going through some stuff in my physical body, and so I was just like struggling with fear. And a couple of days I'd been going by and I was like really struggling with fear. And I'm, I'm not really a fearful person or like a worrisome person. So I was like, what is happening? And so finally one day I just, I felt the mercy of God just come over me and Him just reminding me like, you can trust me. And then that thought came in my head like, wait, I thought I was. <laughs> Lord, I, I have given you my life. I live every day with your purposes in mind. But when that, that impression came on my heart, I'm like, wait, I'm not trusting you fully because this fear is gripping me to the point where even when I would like try to say, God, I trust you, it was like, oh, but, right? And I think we all have been there or we are there. There's things in our lives, people, we gotta get real in church. There is stuff that does not make sense. There is tragedy, there's failure, there's all kinds of things. And it, the enemy uses that to discourage us and make us think that God doesn't see where we're at. He uses that to make us believe that God is not faithful. And we start to get this disillusioned, deceived thing over us. We're like, I don't know, we can trust him a little bit, but not the whole, whole way, you know? And I, I, that day that I was feeling that, I just got on the, side of my bed, which is usually what I do. There's laundry everywhere. The kids are running around. I'm like, oh gosh. And I just got before the Lord, as simple as that. I knelt before him right there in the chaos of life. And I just told him, I said, God, I trust you. I trust you. And anything that I'm withholding from you, I release it to you right now. Didn't really feel any angels walk in the room or like, you know, there was no like light shining on. He's like, you have done what I've asked. Like, it was raw, okay? There was clothes, every, I'm like, right, Lord, you're here with me? But then as I pressed in a little bit more, I dug a little bit deeper into my heart. I started to unravel the areas where I, where I feel like the fear stemmed from, right? There's things that had happened and I, I started to give those to God. And as tears started just streaming down my face, I started to remind myself, God, you are faithful. I started to put into view his mercies where the enemy had brought disillusion and I was like, I don't know. I brought back into alignment with the word of God and I began to just out of my spirit, just say, God, you have been faithful. You have been good. The fact that you rose from the grave, God, that you've forgiven my sins. God, your mercies are new to me right now and I receive them and fear began to break off. Here's the revelation that I got too, is that when I was holding on to this fear, the, the thing, I knew this already, I knew the scripture, but it was like, God is not a God of fear, right? He doesn't cause fear. And here I am sitting in fear, but his promise is, is that he will give us a, a sound mind, right? So on the other side of this altar of promise was the sound mind. But I don't get a sound mind just because I said it. Like, I'm struggling with fear, give me a sound mind. No, 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 it had to come to this point to lay down the fear so that I could step onto the other side and he would give me the fulfillment of that promise. This is not a one-time thing. This isn't just like Tuesday, I built an altar and I'll do it again in 2022. No, this is a daily thing. Do not withhold from God. Even as I was thinking about my parents, they were sitting on the front. Those are not my parents, Jojo and Cammie, but my mom and dad were sitting on the front row. And I just looked over at them, you know, they're getting older and they're, you know, they're still as cute as can be. They're not here, so don't tell them I said that, but they're getting up in age. And, and I started just remembering the sacrifices and the altars that they had built all throughout their lives. And the fact that I'm standing up here and you're sitting right there in all these locations. In the beginning of this church, they sacrificed everything because God told them to. They gave their retirement and their savings. We lived in the spare bedroom of my grandparents' house, all four of us sharing in one room. It was a crazy time. Why? Because God said, hey, lay it down and trust me. And on the other side of that altar, there has been fulfillment after fulfillment, promise after promise. We are all sitting here today because of the altars that they built. So listen, your altar that you build is not just about you. It's about legacy. It is about kids and grandkids and spiritual kids and those who you have contact with and authority over. It is about what happens after that. It's not just about you. This is a big deal. Everything that Abraham gave, it wasn't just about him, it was about the descendants and the nations and us sitting here today because of Abraham's sacrifice, we can freely worship, we can freely come into this place and give God our all because of the altar that he made in that moment. So do not withhold. 
And don't do it out of condemnation, like, wow, that little girl was like, yelling at me and stuff, and now I feel like bad because I haven't made an altar in my room. No, 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 don't do it because of any of that. Do it because of His mercy and His goodness and His compassion and His love and the fact that He sees you today right where you are. He knows you by name. He knows every circumstance. He knows every situation. And He will be faithful. Even when it doesn't make sense to our human thinking, God will be faithful to you. And there was another time on this same hill about 2,000 years ago when a father sent his son to be a sacrifice. His name was Jesus. He went up that hill, he sacrificed. This was the same mountain, it's crazy, kind of in the same region, but the same area. And he sacrificed himself. But listen, the Father didn't provide a different sacrifice in that moment because Jesus was the sacrifice, the perfect spotless lamb. He took the sin and the shame of all of us upon him. He was the promise, he was the fulfillment to the promise. He was the perfect provision. And in that moment, he gave it all. And three days later, he rose from the grave to fulfill the promise again of his faithfulness. God has always been faithful on his word. He has always been true to his promise. And in light of what he did on that cross, in light of what he gave, his perfect spotless son, in light of all of that, today I beckon you, I, I urge you this morning, do not stay where you are. Let go, open up your grip, and release anything that you are withholding from the Father because He wants to pour out His blessing over you. He wants to pour out more mercy over you. He wants to build your faith today. I hope you guys are getting this this morning because it's not just my words, but this is who God says that He is. And if we could just grasp it, if we could just understand we would eliminate so much time wasted. We would eliminate so much time just frustrated and insecure and I don't know, God. We would eliminate all that by just saying, you know what, I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I won't be afraid because you are with me and you stand beside me and you will lead me as I submit, as I stay in this place of worship, of bowing down my life.